I shook a lot of hands this morning. And you just, you know, you can't be too careful. I think Phil touched my pulpit. These products thrive. They're everywhere. For their claims that they kill germs and bugs before they can spread because we are worried about contagion. We're worried about a bug that spreads and we catch it and we're going to get infected. And how many of you carry around sanitizer all the time with you? Come on, wave your hands. It's not a lack of faith. Come on, it's, it's probably wisdom. A bunch of you out there. It's just good to know, isn't it, that somebody's packing really close to you, okay? If you get desperate during the service and go, ooh, you just can turn to a brother or sister and say, you packing today? I need some. Of course, then again, in a concealed carry state, you probably shouldn't be asking the question, are you packing today? Today I want, to revisit, I want to revisit our core values and the fifth of six core values here at Calvary is contagious faith. I want to talk to you about being contagious. On May the 20th, two and a half weeks ago, I was violently ill, as ill as I can ever remember being in a place called Uppingdon, South Africa, wondering if my hope ride had come to an end, wondering if I was going to survive the night. My sickness was such that nobody in their right mind would want to share the same air. And to his credit, my roommate, David, to his credit, because he was so concerned about how bad off I was, when he was offered a room by himself, said, no, I think I better stay close. I'll thank you forever for that. But my sickness was, no one would want to be in the same room with me. It was that violent. Though I was traveling with six Christian brothers, no one was too keen to lay hands on me. My brother pastor from Georgia stayed far away from me. He prayed from the hallway. I think it was the hallway. I have no doubt whatsoever. It was unknown whether my sickness was viral or bacterial, but it raised a primal concern, a primal question among my brothers. It was this, is he contagious? Is there danger that what he has or what has him might spread. And I want to ask the same question of our faith this morning. Are we contagious? Is there any danger that what we have or what has us might spread? The church is modeled for us in Luke's recording of the Acts of the Apostles and there is no question whatsoever that the first church was a contagious church. They had a fever. They were on fire. They changed the people that they met. They changed the people that they touched. They were dangerous to a sin-cursed world. And in Acts chapter 2 and 4 and following, but in, those, in two key passages, we are given keen insights into what was happening in the local church, the conditions, the setting of the local church. And it is quite instructive for us. I start reading at Acts 2 and verse 42. This will be familiar ground for some of you. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed, had, uh, all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds, or the proceeds to all as anyone had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They were contagious. Are we contagious? Or is there little chance that our faith will spread to another? Are we contagious? Or is the Christian epidemic contained in our meeting places, in our tight schedules, in our quarantined hospitality? Are we contagious? Or has fear made the spread of faith almost accidental among us? 
Is there any chance of an outbreak because of you, because of me? Or has the life-changing, soul-saving, sin-killing, death-defying message and commission of Jesus to his church suffered through cultural mutation to be rendered inert? And I wonder, I wonder at that. See, vaccines are weakened forms of a virulent, powerful virus. They're weakened forms, and the body fights them off by creating antibodies. And when the strong virus does come because the antibodies are there, are there, the body jumps in quickly, and it's ready, and it destroys the virus before it can go through a process of reproduction. That's an oversimplification, but it states the facts. And I fear that the church that is not responding or reproducing is little more than a vaccination for the world, a vaccination against the gospel, because the world sees a weakened form and they build resistance until the church and the gospel have almost no power to touch them. When our faith is not a living faith, when our faith is not a replicating faith, a contagious faith, we move people not towards the light, but rather towards darkness. Not towards wholeness, but rather towards sickness. Not towards life, but rather towards death. Are we contagious? Or are we vaccinating the world with a weak Christianity whose main effect, or side effect, I might say, is to render them both deaf and blind? The Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the eye or the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. And I wonder in that blinding process if he is not using the vaccination of a dead church. So as a starting point for assessing our effectiveness, or, or even better, our infectedness, Let's look at a truly world-changing community, the early church, and take a measure, and believe me, this could be a month rather than a week, but let's take a measure of a truly world-changing community and see that we might apply to greater effectiveness. First, as I look in the book of Acts, first I see an impassioned community an impassioned community. They devoted themselves, literally, they gave themselves everything they had, body, soul, and spirit. They devoted themselves. They were passionate about teaching and fellowship and the Lord's table and prayer. They devoted themselves. What is it that makes us passionate? Stop and think about it. What is it that we really get passionate about? By and large, isn't it relationship? relationship that connects us to purpose isn't that what we get passionate about this these relationships i'm passionate about these relationships because they are connecting me to purpose and effect i feel like i'm living when i'm engaged in these relationships faith that is not rooted in relationship is lifeless faith that is not in partnership with god is void of all purpose the act of force, the act of force of our faith is not just what we believed, it is in whom we have believed. It's about relationship. It's not just knowledge, it's knowledge and relationship. It's not just about having right motives or theology, it's about having a living connection with the God who made us for his own divine purpose. And when we are passionate about God and passionate about his body, the church, well, an impassioned community goes viral. People are drawn to passionate people. If you want to grab the attention of this culture, you'd better be impassioned. You better believe what you say. It better be alive within you because if you get up as a talking head and just state a bunch of facts, people tune you out this fast. They're gone. You must, if you will communicate, you must, especially the gospel, you must demonstrate passion. D.L. Moody told his preaching students they had to be impassioned people. He said, get on fire for God and men will come to see you burn. I like that. Get on fire for God and men will come to see you burn. How does one get on 
fire for God, but by growing deeper and deeper in relationship with Him. You don't get on fire for God and not grow in in your relationship with God. As a matter of fact, the fire comes from that experience and that relationship in Him. There's nothing at all attractive about a passionless religion. Some people think there's too much emotion in religion. I would argue there's not enough. It doesn't move us enough. It doesn't shake us enough. It doesn't cause us to weep enough. It doesn't cause us to shout enough. First Church was a devoted church, an impassioned community. It made them contagious. It made them contagious. And, and then they were an empowered community. They were an empowered community. The whole context of the end of the second chapter of the book of Acts is the first four verses of the book of Acts. They had had an experience, an empowering experience that changed their entire landscape. The Bible says that there was awe and wonders and signs. The supernatural was at work within them. They were supernaturally empowered. What they were doing, they were doing not in their own strength, but in the power of the Spirit. We read in Acts 1-4, and while staying with them, Jesus staying with the disciples, this was before the ascension, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. And then in 2, verses 1 and following, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were together in one place, and suddenly there came a sound like a rushing mighty wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. There divided unto them tongues of fire resting over each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were filled with the Spirit not only on the day of Pentecost, but subsequently they were filled again and again and again. In the book of Acts, we're given 28 chapters and a broad view of the church, and they were continually being filled with the Spirit to do the work of the ministry. Somehow we feel that we can bypass the fullness of the Spirit and yet get the work of the church done. I'm here to tell you today it's absolutely impossible. The fullness of the Spirit does not come because one believes on Jesus. The fullness of the Spirit comes when it's invited. Be filled. It's a command. Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. Literally means be being filled. Keep being filled with the Spirit be being, do over and over again. Ask constantly more and more of God's Spirit in your life without the fullness of the Spirit. Unless we are an empowered church, we will fail in the work that we're called to. The fullness of the Spirit comes only as invited. It is sought by impassioned people, people convinced that they cannot change the natural course of the world except by supernatural power. These empowered people prayed and things happened. They spoke. They spoke and moved in a broken world and signs and wonders followed them wherever they went. Where the supernatural power of God is absent, we will depend every time. We will depend on our natural gifts to try and accomplish our God-sized mission. And our gifts will never fit the mission. We will depend on our personalities. We'll depend on our talents. We'll depend on our ability. We'll depend on methodologies. We'll depend on how, but not who. We must be filled with the Spirit if we're going to walk in the Spirit. If we're going to keep in step with the Spirit. We must be filled with the Spirit if we're going to move in the power of the Spirit in the world. The first church was an empowered church. They were living in the light and power of an experience with God. They received power not just once, but again and again, and it made them contagious. So they were an impassioned community, but they were also an empowered community, and the two worked together. And they'll produce the third point. They were a unified community. Passion for God and the power of the Spirit will draw us into unity together. 
all things, they held all things in common, unity. Their empowerment came when they had displayed, first and foremost, a unified obedience. Jesus told them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. And the Bible tells us when the day of Pentecost was fully come, ten days after Jesus' ascension, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were together in one place. They had obeyed the Lord and dwelt in unity. And dwelling in unity, the Spirit's power came. If we want to set the stage for a move of the Spirit at Calvary Church, we must be in unity together. The Lord's going to have to bring us into a lockstep obedience as we follow the voice of the Lord. For in that unity, He will pour out His power. And the lack of unity will rob us of it every time. Throughout the book of Acts, you'll find a church that acts and prays and eats and worships together. Together. In Paul's great fourth chapter to the Ephesians, he appeals them to maintain, maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity is always, is always vulnerable. The same Spirit that empowers us unifies us and when the spirit leads there will be unity and this unity in the first church is clearly illustrated by their attitude towards their possessions the fact that they were holding all things in common it really speaks to their possessions they were a unified church and then we see where they were a distributing a distributing church now, what do you mean by a distributing church? Well, the Bible says they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. This is where we sometimes just check out. This is where all of a sudden the practical nature of this causes us to kind of scratch our heads and say, well, could we really do that? they did you see when the Holy Spirit empowers us and draws us into unity and fills us with a passion for Jesus that drives what we do I me and mine are replaced by you us them and him we possess we possess more than any generation before us we are stuffed with stuff I shook my head last night as I, I raised the garage door. I went in to pull one of the bikes down. I was going to take a ride, and I threw the garage door up, and I looked at all of this stuff. I've had to build racks in my garage to hold the stuff, and when we've moved a bookcase out of the house, I've just relocated it to the, to the garage where I can put more stuff, and I got hooks in the walls everywhere to hang stuff on, and I ask myself, how much of this stuff do I need? And most of you know the frustration. The moment you throw away that stuff, you find out that you need it. The fact of the matter is 90% of that stuff is going to be there untouched next year and the year to follow and the year to follow and it will not be moved until I move. Do you see my dilemma? Personal rented storage units are beyond the understanding of two-thirds of the world. They simply cannot even understand the concept of a personal storage unit. Try and explain to them your neighbor who has two pods sitting in his driveway. And he's not going anywhere. He just ran out of space until you complain or unless you've got a neighborhood um, covenant or something, you're just going to have to live with his pods. Because he's not going to get rid of his stuff because what we possess we hold on to tightly and this is absolutely opposed to what the scripture teaches us about having what we have for a season and for God's use and being free with the resources he has placed in our hands to go and bless the world they held their possessions loosely and those possessions had no power to possess them Nothing has power to possess you when you say, well, you're already gone. If I find a place to give you away, you're, I'm, you're out of my life anyways. It no longer has the power to possess you. When you get to the place where you say, well, I, don't have to, I don't have to have that. 
And if, Lord, if you prompt my heart to do something, I'm, I'm a, it no longer has power the moment you say it. It's, it's already on the block. Lord, just open the door and show me where, but it's gone. It's not mine, it's yours. And I won't hold it too tightly. They held their possessions loosely and their possessions had no power to possess them. The meeting of needs within their community trumped their desire to accumulate wealth. In Acts chapter 4, we pick up and we read in verse 32, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. They were impassioned and unified. And no one said of any of the things that belonged to him it was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, they were empowered, with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as had need. Thus, Joseph who was also called by the apostles Barnabas. Isn't this interesting? This is the first place Barnabas shows up in the Scripture. Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement. Barnabas, who goes and gets Paul out of Arabia. Barnabas, who goes and gets Saul out of Tarshish and takes us to Antioch. Barnabas, who's the lead missionary on the first missionary journey. This key person comes into play here in the Scripture for the first time as we see him selling a piece of land and giving it, giving it to the apostles to distribute for need and it sets, the story for the, for, it sets the stage for the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And that's what we see most in chapter 5. But back up for a moment. This is where we're introduced to Barnabas who demonstrates that this was his heart and soul. This is who he was. Before he, even, before he even engaged in any missionary activity, he was already one who said, what I have is the Lord's. They saw a need and they met it. Doesn't James challenge us in his provocative letter when he says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So long as we love our stuff more than people, so long as we value our safety nets more than the man dying without Christ, so long as we are driven by self-interest and self-preservation and making ourselves rich, our voice in the world will be a mere whisper. There'll only be a shadow of Christianity, a hint. There'll only be hints along the way. We'll just leave cookie crumb trails. Our message will lack transformative power. Our mission will diverge from His mission. And as a result, the church will be increasingly, increasingly anemic the early church, they weren't takers, they were givers. The very nature of who they were, they were givers. Takers cannot change the world for good. There is not a nation, there is not a city out there ha that has yet erected a statue to celebrate what somebody took. Those who took are labeled as despots, and when they put up statues to themselves, as soon as their power base is overcome, the statue is torn down because no one celebrates what was taken. We all celebrate what is given. The ultimate sacrifice, a gift of great benevolence, it's what is given, that's what we celebrate. And within the church, we need to ask ourselves the question, are we takers or are we givers? What God has committed to us, can it be distributed or do we have it locked down? Can God's economy begin to work through us or are we non-participators in His economy? If we're going to be contagious in a culture that is built on self, we are going to have to become selfless. Or to say it in a clearer fashion, we're going to have to be like Jesus. We're going to have to find a new way to measure our wealth. They were impassioned. They were empowered. They were unified. They were distributing. They were a worshiping community. And day by day, the scripture says, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Their celebration of their faith was not bondage. Nor was it drudgery. 
their religion went home with joy. Their religion got outside of the four walls of the temple and it invaded their family tables and their family tables became an open door to anyone who wanted to come and sit enjoying their hospitality. Their religion got away from the four walls of a church and began to infect their communities. It overflowed their dinner tables. Their religion was marked by gladness and generosity and praise and they found favor with all the people that's not a great surprise is it who do you want to hang around who do you want to be with someone who's happy or someone who's not how many of you look for the most miserable people on the face of the earth to populate your friend list you say well, all my friends are miserable maybe you've made them that way it's just a suggestion okay this isn't an implication or a prophetic word it's just a suggestion that if you are surrounded by people like that and everyone around you seems miserable, possibly you're the common link. And you need to ask yourself the question, do I give joy to the hearts of those around me? Do I make people around me glad? Is my life full of praise? Is my life overflowing with rejoicing? Do people want to be around me because I'm happy? Say, no, you're nuts. It's all right. Heavy hearts joyous hearts. These were not withdrawing hermits living a bunker faith. They were alive. They were involved. They were joyful. They were generous. They were positive. They were upbeat. They were vital people. And these people are always attractive. They are certainly contagious. People often wonder how in the world I was ever able to convince my wife, first of all, just to go out with me. You didn't know me then. I am so much more refined now. No, slightly. We were a shock couple. People wouldn't have ever put us together. She was classy. I wasn't. She was scared of me. Because I made fun of everybody. I was... I always had a comment. My mouth was always rolling. My brain was rarely engaged, but my mouth had a very, very healthy vocabulary. And I spun out a lot of words, and I said a lot of things, and I had a lot of fun. And I didn't have a clue, but people tried to figure out those two, you may think we're the odd couple. Well, most couples are. Most of them don't line up. They don't have the same personalities. And often, in many cases, they are exact opposites. And we certainly are opposites in, in almost every, every... She was scared of me my freshman year. I was loud. Well, she, not so much. As a matter of fact, I didn't hear the girl speak a word for three years. I think there were other people on campus who heard her whisper a few times. But I never heard her say a single word. She was reserved. I was completely off the reservation. I had three inhibitions. You know, I kind of named them. We were opposites. But I had an edge. I had an edge. The other guys didn't even see me coming. I could name them right now. I got all their names, several of them. They thought they had the inside track. They didn't have a, they did not stand a chance because I had a secret weapon. It wasn't good looks. Well, God, you know that. It wasn't good grades. I promise you that too. It wasn't the promise of great success. Any success I have now comes at the abject surprise of my Professors. Want to know what my secret was? I was fun. I was a rolling riot. I was joyous. If there was laughter, I was in. I had a, I had a, 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 a sixth sense. I could sense something funny going on somewhere and I was going to go get right in the middle of it. 
And if I got in the middle of it, I'd try and ratchet it up and take it to a whole new place. My first couple years in, in college, it was all about laughing. We even had t-shirts made, laugh at life. I remember, how did it go? It went like. Had a little symbol we wore. Bunch of us guys on the floor. Idiots, but we were fun. A lot of people at Bible college are no fun whatsoever. As a matter of fact, they're offended by fun. And they think God's offended by fun. I'm of the opinion, purely opinion, I'm of the opinion that he laughed a lot with us those years. Some of it wasn't, some of it, you know, he rebuked us for and corrected us and, and all of that. But, but some of us, I wonder at times if God in heaven didn't just look down and say, those guys are funny. <laughs> If there was laughter I was in and I gained an edge on my competition through joy. You want to gain an edge on your competition? You want to live a life that's rich? Get filled up with joy. Get a love for life. It's always attractive on every level. And if you have joy in life, people will naturally and supernaturally be attracted to you. No one wants to be around a constant downer. If people are avoiding you, they have a very good reason. Nobody wants to live in the world of a constant complainer. Nobody wants a steady diet of negativism. Oh, what a beautiful day. Yeah, they say it's going to rain tonight. Now, I'm planning on getting out there. Watch it, man. Cars are killing people every day. Have you read the statistics about here in Greensboro? A lot of people have died out there on bicycles. Well, we'll be careful. Well, a lot of them were really careful, too. Some really good people, and they're dead right now. I mean, it's like, oh. You been there? Doesn't matter what it is. I've tried to, I've made the mistake of trying to dig people out. Have you ever done that? Well, you're standing there and, and, you know, sister or brother, they're standing there and you're digging for all you're worth and every shovel you throw out, they bring in an end loader, boop, 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 and they dump about four more yards of dirt in there and you're left with your little shovel. And no, it's not even a shovel, you got a spoon, you got a spoon and you're, you're trying to help them. So, oh, it's really not that, oh, yes, it is, brother. And you no, know, it's really, it's really not, I want you to get new, per no, and they just keep dumping and dumping and dumping and dumping and dumping and you said... And you're being sarcastic. Yeah, I'm making a point. I hope, I hope it's coming through. Nobody wants to be around that steady diet of negativism. Pessimism carries its own contagion, and that contagion will always lead to death. The first church, even facing persecution and death, they were facing the real deal. How many of you are worried that we're going to be killed for our faith here in America tomorrow? How many of us are worried that a faction's going to rise up in the U.S. government, a faction's going to rise up in the culture, and they're just going to start killing people in churches? There are a few of you that are just pessimistic enough to believe that. I know that. I'm not trying to stir you up. But most of us don't believe for a moment that we'll be in danger from our brothers tomorrow, but the early church was in danger always of being drug off to prison. They were in danger of being killed. They were in danger of being outcast within their culture and completely separated from everything they had, had grown to know and love. They lived in that danger zone and they lived there with joy. They were filled with fellowship and generosity and hope. What face are we showing the world? I fear that the face we show the world is the face of a frown. Not the, not the face of a clown, the face of a frown. I'm afraid that most of our hospitable tables are empty. Who would come for pity's sake? Send out an invitation. I'd like you to come over to our house Friday night for dinner. We're gonna, we are going to gripe and whine and complain for... The first 15 minutes, we're going to tear the preacher apart, and, and, uh, and a few of you might gravitate to it, but the first 15 minutes, we're going to get the preacher, and then we're going to unload on that deacon board, because God knows we've got a problem, and then when we get that deacon board, then we're going to talk about the staff, and once we tear the staff down, well, we're going to just talk about culture, and then, and once we're good and warmed up, then we're switching to politics, and boy, look out, because I'll tell you, nobody's doing that right, and we're going to whine, and we're going to gripe, and we're going to complain about politics, and we're all going to go home mad how many of you would send in your RSVP. You want to know why a lot of our tables are empty? 
For one, we don't have that equitable spirit and that joyous spirit that says we want to engage and invite people into our lives. Secondly, if we did, we would pollute. We would pollute them unless our tables are filled with joy and hospitality. I'm afraid that joy is not a word that is often used to describe us as it should be. I'm, I'm afraid that the abundant life that we sing about and talk about is simply not an evidence. Charles Spurgeon in, in a little book called Spurgeon's Notes, it's one of my favorite of, of his copious, right? And he has so many books. But there's this, this one called Spur, Spurgeon's Notes to his, to his pastors, to his students. And in reading through, it's really funny. He has this dry, dry sense of humor, and he captured the essence of what I'm saying when he was addressing his students and trying to explain to them the importance of communicating with your whole body and your face and your vocal, your volume, all of those things. He was such a tactician. He said, when you talk about heaven, let your face radiate joy and happiness. And when you talk about hell, your everyday face will do. What does your everyday face communicate? They were impassioned. They were empowered. They were unified. They were distributing, they were worshiping, they were testifying, they were a testifying community. Verse 33 in chapter 4, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They were telling the story. Where there is no testimony, there is no power. If we won't put ourselves out there, we can't catch the wind of the Spirit. God does not send the fullness of the wind of the Spirit to blow us around sanctuaries. He sends the wind of His Spirit to send us into the teeth of the storm, to sail the blue waters. Like most beautiful sailboats in a sheltered bay, we can't sail except we spread those sails in the wind, and you won't find them in the harbor. Most sailboats going out of the harbor are running what? They're running a little outboard to get them out where they can catch the wind. And this is a primary problem we are facing in the American culture and the church. We are all bottled up in our harbors with very expensive sailboats and canvas that has never really known the test of the wind. Sherry and I lived on a lake, a beautiful lake in Stockton, Missouri for the first four and a half years of our ministry. And about, um, about a year, i got to tell this quickly, about a, a year into our, our ministry, or maybe a year and a half, I met a guy named Willard Barrow. And Willard was one of those farmers who never let loose of anything that he bought. And he had barns full of all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. But he was getting old and he realized he needed to get rid of some of it. And, and uh, I, bought a, I bought an old Ford Torino that had like 31,000 actual miles on it that had just sat there forever. Got it cleaned up and it became cheap transportation for us for, for a while. But in one of the barns, I saw sitting there and literally the, uh, the muck and the refuse and everything that, that, you, that you run into in a, bar, in a barn was halfway up the tires and the, and the wheels. So almost right up to the axles and it was covered over. But there I found an Arkansas Traveler fiberglass speedboat with an Evinrude 70 horse motor on it. It had been covered over roughly by a tarp. It had some damage, no holes in it or that type of thing, but it, it looked a little weathered and worn because it hadn't been covered properly and all of that. But the more I looked at that, I thought, you know, that boat probably doesn't have 100 hours on it. And one day I was talking to Willard, and I said, Will Willard, what are you going to do about the boat? He said, I haven't even thought about the boat. I forgot about the boat. It's been sitting on that barn for, for years and years, and since my kids are grown, and, and nobody's going to ever use it anymore. It's just, he said, would you be interested in that boat? And I said, <laughs> Yeah, I live on a lake. That would be great. And so we went back and we popped the motor off that, or the top off that Evan Rood motor. And when we topped the, the cap off that motor, and it was about this big around. Remember those big old motors? It was about that big around, two clasps on either side. When we folded that thing back, that motor inside looked absolutely pristine. And I looked around and I thought, well, there's, there, it may need to be loosened up. And, but I know a mechanic in the church who works on boats, and I'll bet or associated with the church. I'll bet he knows what he's doing. And, and of course, all, all the rubber lines and everything, I knew they'd be rotted out, but that's not a big thing to replace. Went down to the parts store and started getting a few things that we needed. My mechanic friend came along and said, this thing's in pristine shape. For $400, I bought a speedboat. 
with a 70 horse motor on it. The windshield was cracked, so I just cut it down to about half side. It looked rather rakish. A couple of parts were rotted out on the inside, sure, rebuilt the inside, we put seats in that thing, and, and got it all set up. And before long, I had, a, I had to put tires on that thing. But before long, I had, a, I had a boat on a trailer. I had a truck that could haul it, and I was one and a half miles from the most beautiful sailing lake in Missouri. Back that thing down in, and we were in the boat business. And we had great fun with that boat. As a matter of fact, we tried to induce Ashley to come into the world with a good hard ride in the boat. Sherry was running late and we thought if we just go bounce on the waves for a little bit then gravity's going to take its course and Ashley will be born and didn't work but we had a great time anyways. We had our boat, we kept it in a little state park marina and in a slip there, a covered slip. But from that slip every time I went to the boat and every time we would go out we would go back, we would go by probably 50 or 60 beautiful sailboats that were either tied to a tether or on another dock that didn't have any covering over the top but you could see and some of you can hear this because you've walked down those wooden docks before and you can hear the clanging of the rigging as it bangs on the aluminum poles of the of the sailboats and I have that thought and I can see the birds and I can smell the marina I can walk right back into that setting and I can tell you in all of the years that we would go out to the marina in the evening and we would take our boat out for a little bit of a ride or we'd go out with a friend and do a little bit of water skiing and that type of thing I never saw saw of all those beautiful sailboats I never saw them heading out except on rare occasions to unfurl their sails and go it's my prayer today that somebody will push off the dock and motor out of the calm and the comfort that has kept your faith bottled up and that you'll put up a sail and take a risk and let the wind of the Spirit fill your sails that you might know the thrill of the life that He has called you to live, a life that impacts the world with a contagious faith. We don't see miracles at home like we see on the mission field. And a lot of people say, how come we don't see so much over here and we hear about so much over there? Well, bottom line is, here at home we have surrogates for everything that God offers. And here at home, we don't put ourselves out there. I know people who go halfway around the world and they will put themselves out there and they come home and it's like something switches and they won't walk across the hall at work. If God sends a mighty wind into the church and the church is in harbor, it will have the effect of a tidal surge and it will wreck every boat in the harbor. When a big storm is coming, if a storm is coming that can do devastation within a harbor, the smart sailor gets in his boat and he gets out into the storm. He goes out into the deep because he'll be able to ride the storm out there and in the harbor he will be ultimately destroyed. And our churches are weak because so many of our boats are sitting in the harbor and praying that God would send a big wind. And they are literally praying their own destruction. It is only as we begin to engage the world and we pull up the sails and we risk it all and we sail on, it is only then that we'll experience the big wind. It is only then that we're going to be able to see what He's called us to see and go where He's called us to go. If we want to experience God's wind, we've got to get out of the harbor. Most of the miracles in the New Testament did not occur within the framework of the disciples gathered together. Some did, but most of them occurred wherever they met the world. They were a testifying community. Well, and finally, they were an expanding community. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The church is vested with drawing power, Jesus said in John 12 32 and I when I'm lifted up from the earth will draw all men to myself the Holy Spirit draws people John chapter 6 44 no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him I will raise him up in the last day he is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance the work of the Spirit is a drawing work and if that's so then what stands in the way a faith that is by no means virulent, an armada that is bottled up in a harbor, natural responsibilities or natural abilities that have supplanted supernatural necessities, 
self as opposed to selflessness. Silence or shame or fear. Fullness and a lack of hunger. A blinding satisfaction with ourselves and the world can just go to hell. And I pray, O oh God, from whom we so often demand all of our damning comforts. I pray, O oh God, please let us feel again the warm flush that comes with a fever. Make us uncomfortable and make us contagious for the advance of your kingdom, for the passion of your heart, for the lost. I challenge you, my brothers, my sisters, who share with me all of the comforts of safe harbor. Before you die, don't you want to know the thrill of sailing the big seas? Before we die, we need to get out of this harbor. Father, I pray that by your Spirit, you would confirm in our hearts your challenge to us today. I pray, Heavenly Father, in a message that speaks in such broad terms, that you would bring sharp focus until we know the next thing to do. Help us, Lord, because we'll look for a manual, we'll look for points we can click off a list, and before we can do, we've got to be. And so we pray, change us. Challenge us. Infect us with love. Not just with the words, with the real thing. 